Culture this morning. I'm delighted you're here and delighted to welcome Drew Bratcher as our speaker this morning. Brandon's going to introduce him in a moment, but I do want to give you a couple of announcements first. At the end of this lecture, we're going to wander over to the Tadlock House. We're going to have coffee and some time for conversation. If you'd like to come join us. Hello. There we are. Um, I thought I had been censored there for a minute. I wasn't sure. Uh, so we'll go to the Tadlock House. We'll be at, uh, if you're interested in having lunch a little bit later, uh, let me know because we may not be on campus, but you're welcome to join us. We may, in the interest of honoring Hank Williams, go to the burger bar for lunch. So that may be lunch today. But if you want to come along, please do let me know. This evening at 7 o'clock at the Birthplace of Country Music, Drew will be speaking and reading again. And we look forward to that. On our next uh, event will be October 30th. This will be our student lecture for the fall, which will be given by Aidan Swatzel. So come out and hear Aidan on October 30th. We then have our Beekner lecture on November 6th, which is Esau McCulley, and we finish the semester on November 13th with a Virginia law professor uh, called Barbara Armacost. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, join us afterwards if you can, and I'm going to ask Brandon to introduce our speaker. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure I have this morning to introduce Drew Bratcher. Um, I want to talk about another writer quickly. I play music with a guy called Ed Snodderly, who is a songwriter who's just released an album of songs called Chimney Smoke, and it's the first album that uh, he's made since his mother passed away. And the album's not really about that, but in a lot of the songs, uh, she shows up if I'm reading it correctly. And I know this because it's the first album of songs he's made since my mother passed away. And even though these songs are about Ed's experiences and his family and his mother, it's an invitation when you hear them for me to remember and to celebrate and to grieve in my own family. There's a, there's a song he has where a lady pulls a pack of juicy fruit out of her pocketbook which is something my mom wouldn't do, but she would definitely pull a pack of certs out of her purse because we grew up in the Midwest. Drew Bratcher does this work on a large scale um, in this opening essay of this collection, Bub, in describing his grandfather, his Bub, in beautiful, hilarious, and elegiac detail. He invites us to take a look at our own families, at our own grandparents, our own grandfather, his hands, his ear, his clothes, and to hear their voices, to remember their stories and their wisdom. And through meeting Bub, uh, we meet Drew. And in Drew, we see not just our family stories, but our own stories, or at least I did. Because many of us are not so far removed from a much different way of life, a less modern way of life and a more rural way of life. Drew also writes about country music, which along with NASCAR, as you know, is Bristol's bread and butter. I know parts of Bristol maintain a skepticism about Nashville. I know people in Johnson City that don't even like Knoxville. So it's, there's some, some real skepticism in Tennessee about other Tennessee places. But these essays never dip into cynicism, but instead they examine the line between authenticity, which we love a lot in Bristol, we say we do, and show business, or in country music, geography and ideology. All the time he's asking the question, what does this music that I love say about where I'm from and say ab about who I am? And he's asking the question every student should be asking when they read, and that is, uh, what does this writer know about me that I don't know yet? Drew has an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, which is the finest in the country. He's published articles in the New York Times, the Oxford American, the Paris Review. Of course, for greatest significance to us in Bristol, Garden and Gun, and he comes to us from Wheaton College in Illinois. Please welcome Drew Bratcher. It's good to be with you this morning. 
Thanks for that warm welcome on a chilly day. I believe this too, but I'm going to set it aside just for a second. All right, my subject this morning is storytelling, where it comes from and what it gives us. And the first story goes like this. One day, a boy said to himself, this business about everybody having to die, I don't like it a bit. I'm going to find the place where one never dies. So he said goodbye to his parents, and he departed. For weeks and for many, many miles, he roamed, asking everyone that he came in contact with if they could show him the way to the, to the place where one never dies. But no one could help him. Eventually, he came to a mountain. And there, at the bottom of the mountain, there was an old man. And this old man had a beard that came down to about here. He asked the old man, sir, sorry to interrupt you, but could you point me to the land where one never dies? The old man looked at him skeptically. I've never heard of such a place, he said. But he added, stay here with me. See that wheelbarrow over there? For as long as it takes for me to haul off this entire mountain in that wheelbarrow, you will not die. The boy said, how long do you think that will take? He said, who could say, a hundred years? And the boy said, what happens at the end of a hundred years? And the old man said, well, at that point, you'll, you'll die. And the boy said, thank you for the offer, but I'm looking for the land where one never dies. And he said farewell. He kept going. Eventually, he came to a forest that stretched for as long as you could see. And there at the edge of the forest, there was another old man. And this one's beard went down to about his waist. He had a pruning fork, and he was trimming the trees of the forest. When the boy asked him about that land where one never dies, the old man said, never heard of the place, but stay with me. For as long as it takes me to prune this entire forest, you will not die. The boy asked him how long it would take. He said, about 200 years. And the boy bid him farewell in search of the land where one never dies. He walked how, who knows how many miles until he eventually came to the end of the land and there in front of him stretched a vast sea. And on the shore of the sea, there was another old man and this one's beard was all the way down to his knees. Beside him, there was a duck drinking water from the sea. And the boy asked him about the land where one never dies. The man said, I've got the next best thing though. Stay here with me for as long as it takes for this little duck to drink this entire sea dry. You will not die. And the boy asked him, how long will that take? And the man said, 300 years. And the boy said, thank you for the offer, but I'm looking for the land where one never dies. Well, he was about to give up on his journey, thinking that it had been foolhardy all along. When off in the distance, he saw a mansion up on a hill, and he walked towards it. Night was falling. He knocked on the front door. He waited for a little while, no answer. He walked around to the back door, knocked on it, no answer, and he was about to head back for home when the front door swung open. And there standing in the door was yet another old man. And this one had the longest beard he'd ever seen in his life. It was touching the floor and like a robe was billowing out behind him. And the boy said, sir, sorry to trouble you. And the man said, it's no trouble. What do you, how can I help you? And the boy said, I'm looking for the land where one never dies. And the man lit up and he said, you found it. This is the place where one never dies. Come inside and stay with me for as long as you live here, you will not die. So the boy stayed there with the old man, living such a one, having such a good time that he forgot how much time had passed. Well, one morning he came down to breakfast and he said to the old man, I know that I'm not supposed to leave the house, but I'm curious about my family. And the man said, your family, they've long since passed. And he said, well, I'd at least like to see my hometown. And the man said, does it even exist anymore? And he said, I don't know, but I, I really want to see for myself. And so 
The old man, seeing that he was curious and that his curiosity would not be sated, said, there's one way that you can do this. In my barn, there is a white horse that rides like the wind. Get on the horse. Go as fast as you can back to where you need to go, but do not get off of the horse. The second that your foot touches the ground, you will die. And the boy said, thank you. I will do exactly as you say. And the next morning, he got ready for his trip, got on the horse, and headed back towards his home. He came to that sea that he had passed initially, although there wasn't any sea anymore. It was just a little puddle, dry lake bed as far as you could see. And he thought to himself, I'm glad I didn't stop here. He came to that forest eventually, although there wasn't much of a forest anymore. It was just branches sort of blowing in the wind. He came to the mountain. It just was a gravel lot. Eventually, he came to the place that he thought was where he was from, though he didn't recognize it, and nobody in the town remembered him or knew anything about his family. So he turned to head back to the mansion and the old man. As he did so, off in the distance, he saw just to the side of the road a cart that was stuck in a rut right beside the road. And there was an old man, and he was trying to get the cart back up onto the road. And as the boy got closer, he saw that in the cart there were shoes. The old man hollered out to him. He said, son, can you please help me? I'm old. It's hard for me to move this cart. I could really use your help. And the boy felt bad about it, but he said, I'm under strict orders not to get off my horse. I'm sorry I have somewhere to be. And the man said, do you not have any pity? I'm an old man. You're young. Help me. And the boy, overcome with the desire to help the old man, stepped off of the horse. And the second that he did, the man grabbed him by the arm. And he said, son, do you know who I am? And the boy looked at him, and he said, I am death. And do you see what's in my cart? And the boy looked again at the shoes. And he said, these are all the shoes that I've worn out trying to find you, but now I have you, and so you must go where everyone else who has flesh must go, to the land where we die. In a recent essay in the New Yorker magazine, the book critic Parul Segal expressed a sentiment more and more resonant, you've probably heard it, that storytelling has run its course. Narrative exhaustion has set in. So ubiquitous, so universally deployed has it become by corporations and, yes, colleges, by political strategists and by pastors, by podcasts and conferences, that it's time to move on from it. Time to find new ways of relaying experience and information and wisdom. Seagal's essay reminded me of an exchange between two of my friends on Twitter, back when it was still called Twitter. I hate the ahistorical caveman around the campfire mysticism of the term storyteller, one of them said, to which the other replied, this is basically why public radio has collapsed into a pool of moth radio hour, TED radio hour, et cetera. The storytelling, all caps, ideology is in full effect. Point taken, right? It's true. We really are, in the year 2023, overwhelmed with stories. And it can be a little suffocating, a little disorienting. I mean, if everything is narrative, narrative can't help but lose some of its power and appeal and trustworthiness. And yet, for all the hazards that come with it, for all the ways that stories are often used and misused to manipulate our lives and sell us things we most certainly do not need, to crowd out other stories, particularly the ones that maybe we don't want to hear but really need to hear, the truth is that we can no more escape stories, as that one I opened with illustrates, than we can escape, well, death. What does that story, which comes from Ver Verona, and goes back centuries, and which at some point was written down and then included in Italo Calvino's great anthology of Italian folk tales. What does that story say? What is it about? 
Well, it's about mortality, of course, about how death is sure and certain and coming for us all sooner or later, whatever our creative or desperate attempts at evasion or delay, however much money we invest in life-expanding technology, it's still the case that one out of every one of us will die and have done and will continue to if, as the old saints used to say, the Lord tarries. Hank Williams put it this way, no matter how I struggle and strive, I'll never get out of this world alive. A prophecy that he fulfilled maybe right here in Bristol. And yet, that story is about something else too. It's about storytelling, that ancient and abiding human exchange. And what it tells us about stories is that at their essence, right at their very core, they are made possible, indeed given their warrant, by death. Death, the end, the ebb, the imminent, the final page, the last note, well, it creates pressure and urgency. It provides a frame, a measurable flow, not to mention an incentive. What we have, we will one day lose. So best to make a record while there's a record to be made. Why do stories exist? Why do we feel the need to tell them, to hear them told? Because death exists, the story says. No death, no narrative. In short, no story. The second story goes like this. You've got a copy of it there if you picked up one of those sheets on the way in. Long ago, in Kentucky, I, a boy, stood by a dirt road in first dark and heard the great geese hoot northward. I could not see them, there being no moon and the stars sparse. I heard them. I did not know what was happening in my heart. It was the season before the elderberry blooms. Therefore, they were going north. The sound was passing northward. That's the first stanza of a poem by Robert Penn Warren, who grew up in Kentucky near the Tennessee border. First published in 1969, it's the last in a lengthy sequence, perhaps the most beautiful set of verses that Penn Warren ever wrote about the famous bird illustrator, John James Audubon. And here at the end of that cycle, Penn Warren brings his biographical inquiry into Audubon home by rooting his interest in the artist in a brief yet expansive recollection from his childhood in Kentucky. And he does so by telling a story. But what kind of story is it that Penn Warren tells here? If by story, what comes to mind is a legendary epic, a fairy tale, a manipulative corporate marketing campaign, a conversion testimony, or a literary device used to foist meaning onto unrelated fragments, well, the story Penn Warren tells doesn't measure up. It would almost seem to be an anti-story. I mean, there's not enough plot, not enough characters, not enough exposition to constitute a story. What does story mean in this poem, which is called Tell Me a Story? What kind of story does Penn Warren want to hear? The second stanza of the poem is helpful here. Tell me a story, Penn Warren goes on, in this century and moment of mania. Tell me a story. Make it a story of great distances and starlight. The name of the story will be time, but you must not pronounce its name. Tell me a story of deep delight. Death creates stories, necessitates them. In a death-haunted world, life takes the fraught, if inevitable, form of narrative. But here, Penn Warren argues that stories also help us live. They're like food, like water, but for the human heart. They are a means by which we survive and try to make sense of our experience as we do. They're the horse, as it were, 
upon which we briefly escape death's hold. What, according to Robert Penn Warren, does a good story do? Well, for one, it's an antidote to the private and public mania of the age, any age. And boy, is our age marked by this. In this century and moment, he writes, of mania, tell me a story. Now, it's not that stories bring perfect order out of the chaos of our world and lives. That's putting it too simply. No, no story can do all that. Rather, the desire often felt in the midst of, a, of, of upheaval, of mania, to hear a story, I think testifies to the elusiveness of the reality in which we find ourselves, to how very difficult it often is to discern what it all means. And at the same time, the desire to hear a story testifies to our expectation, ever abiding, stubbornly enduring, whatever evidence to the contrary, that there will be meaning, must be meaning, that by and by we'll find something of good use to wring from our experience, however strange, tough, and confounding so much of life remains. Second, Penn Warren writes, stories travel great distances and starlight. That's what he wants his story to include. Stories, after all, remind us that there's an elsewhere that we're not the only ones, that the stars up in the sky shine on all God's creatures and have done for as long as we've been here. And we'll still be doing so after we're gone, just as they did before we arrived. The DC writer, Ernest P. Jones, says that a story is, quote, the record of a change. We're different in the end than when we started. Sometimes it's relationships that change, a setting perhaps, at other times it's only our minds that have moved a half an inch. The boy in that first stanza of Penn Warren's poem, well, he's in the same physical spot the whole time. And yet those geese, invisible yet actual, hooting northward, well, their migration across a truly great distance has the effect of firming up that dirt road in his mind, of turning it to marble, transforming that fleeting moment into a monument in his memory. You get the sense from the poem that what he hears there, senses there, but cannot see, has nevertheless transformed his perception, has never stopped quickening by quieting his heart. The great irony, of course, is that although we are inundated with stories, as that New Yorker essay articulated, we're more and more starved of them, aren't we, personally? When we put down our phones and turn off our TVs, when we find ourselves around a table or a campfire, on a road trip or with a pen in our hands in front of an empty notebook page, in the quiet of the night or the still of the early morning, are we possessed of stories? Or do we feel, particularly in those moments, our lack and our need for them? Penn Warren says, slow down, be attentive. You don't have to go searching. You don't need the budget of the Marvel Universe. You don't need to have traveled the world or even to have lived to old age. You don't have to manufacture a thing. What you need is your senses. You just need a good mile of road, a sliver of sky, a heart beating in your chest, and who knows? Time, Penn Warren goes on, time with a capital T, is what in the long run this and every story will be called. But for the time being, living as we do inside of time, under its rule, instead of outside of it, beyond it, with no need for it, we direct our attention to more particular narratives, to time's expression in the changing seasons, to the flowers that bloom, to, to, to the direction the winds and the birds fly. A third story. Growing up, I lived a quarter of a mile from my grandparents in the hills north of Nashville. On Friday nights, my grandmother would fix a big supper and then we'd stay over and work around the place all Saturday. When I was old enough to stay up with the adults after supper on Friday night, I would sit in the corner of the porch in a rocking chair, listening to them tell stories. In the woods around the porch, crickets and bullfrogs 
made a mighty ruckus. The winds would wrestle in the tall trees. The world outside was dark and loud and utterly oblivious to us. And yet there was my grandfather and his friends, alive and talking, as if their lives were worth talking about, in voices that had a resonance all out of proportion to their sound. What I remember from those nights, even now, is a kind of heaviness, intensity, a state of heightened alertness that made my mind reel and my cheeks ache. In silence, I strained to hear every word, somehow jealous for the experience I was already having, out of time already, while still in the thick of it. One night on that porch, my younger cousins, who'd been sent off to bed after dinner, came tugging at my shirt sleeves. They'd heard a coyote, they said, from their bedroom, and they were scared. I shooed them off, not wanting to have my revelry interrupted, and when they returned a few minutes later, I did the same, telling them to grow up and pushing them back through the door. Nothing out there, I said. The third time, my uncle, their father, he intercepted them before they could get to me. He knelt down to eye level. What's wrong, boys, he asked. They told him about the coyote. I was sure he was going to tell them there was nothing to be worried about and then send them back to bed, perhaps with a warning not to leave the bedroom again. Instead, he asked them to point exactly to where they'd heard the sound. They were taken aback too. Tentative, tentatively, they pointed in the direction of the fruit trees out behind the house. There, he said, pointing, and they nodded their yes. Stay right here, my uncle said. And then he rose and he turned for the screen door. I watched with my cousins as my uncle walked across the driveway to his pickup truck, watched as he pulled a gun from the bed of the truck. And by this point, the others on the porch had caught wind of the disturbance. Spotting my cousins who were still hunched together by, by my chair, my grandfather called them over and told them about the, and they told him about the coyote. Now everyone was watching. Pow. My uncle fired one shot and then another. The sound was deafening, but for its own echo, which rolled over the din of the summer night in waves. He placed the gun back in the truck and returned to the porch. That coyote won't be bothering you no more, he told my cousins. And then he told me to take the boys and get off to bed. I fell asleep that night looking at that lit porch through the bedroom window, thinking about the stories I wasn't hearing because of my scaredy cat cousins who lay in the bed beside me already asleep. Well, the next morning, my grandmother, who was already in the middle of cooking breakfast, asked me to collect some pears from the orchard. She wanted to fry them. I grabbed a bucket from the garage and headed into the yard. I salvaged what I could of the pears that had fallen to the ground, tossed the bruised and the bug gourd ones under the fence for the horses, others I picked from low-hanging branches. And my bucket was about half full when I began to smell something awful in the fruit trees. The farther I walked, the stronger the smell became. And then at the base of one of the apple trees, one of those low apple trees that you can climb up into easy, I saw a clump of what looked like fur, grizzled hair. And I set the bucket down and climbed up inside. And there in front of my eyes on a low branch was a coyote shot clear through the side. I jumped out of that tree and stumbling, I ran as fast as I could. I've never run faster for the house. When my grandmother asked about the pears, I'd left the bucket back in the yard. I said, Nan, you will not believe. In that Penn Warren poem, there's one more thing he calls for in the very last line. Tell me a story, he concludes, of deep delight. Delight, as it turns out, is a word that recurs in Penn Warren's poetry. Out of silence walks delight, he writes elsewhere. Delight comes on soundless foot into the silence of night or into broad daylight. Delight comes like surprise. He goes on, I have met delight at dawn crest. I've met delight at dove fall. I may not divulge the rest, nor may it be guessed. In this conception of delight, Surprise is central. Surprise and mystery. 
It's less about pleasure, I think, has very little to do with merriment. It's closer to joy, with all of joy's unpredictability, even agony, with its undercurrent of sorrow, how it humbles us by exposing our assumptions and vulnerabilities and leaves us prone, leaves us in awe, which is to say, with a truer sense of reality. Delight evinces a wonder that life in this death-sure world would not seem to have given us, a wonder that stories preserve and make shareable. And this is another way of saying that stories have much to do with hope. When I tell that story about the coyote, I do, I do. I feel like that boy who's just stepped off the horse and feels death's surprising grip on his arm, reeling for sure, but also braced, you know? And I feel something like the young poet as well, posted up by that dirt road, looking up, not sure what's happening in his heart. That was the very first story of my own that I remember telling. The fact was not lost on me that if my uncle had done what I'd wanted him to do, I wouldn't have had a thing to say. And what's the most surprising thing about it? Well, of that, I'm still not sure. The sight of a dead coyote in an apple tree, that's surprising. Or a gruff uncle's unexpected tenderness towards his sons. Or maybe it's the fact that I'd be standing in front of you all now telling that story all these years later, hoping against hope that between now and whenever the old Carter takes you by the arm and leads you on to your eternal home, here in our very own century of mania, you'll tell and retell and write and take deep delight in some stories of your own. Thank you.